Okay, so we will start with foundation of all good qualities. So set, uh, settling the mind and reconnecting with the motivation. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to them is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so of all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. Connecting with that. So today um, I'm going to be using a PowerPoint, and if for some reason it's too small to read on the screen, I've emailed it to everybody. So I don't know if you have your phones or your computers with you, but um, it should be big enough. I tried to make the text big, but um, if it's not, you have it in your email. And um, it's going to be basically a little review of Perfect Human Rebirth that we did last week and then segue into death and impermanence. So we're right now we're in that transition point between the preliminaries and the small scope. So here we go. So from the verse that we just looked at, related to perfect human rebirth is verse two. So as we just said, understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful, and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. 
So of course, we hope to have many human rebirths from now until enlightenment is achieved or a rebirth in a pure land or something that is conducive to the spiritual path. But this particular one that we're in right this second will never come again. This particular set of conditions, this particular body is a one-time only thing. And the specific freedoms of this day and time and body and the way the mind is now is incredibly meaningful and is difficult to find again in terms of something similarly conducive to the spiritual path. So please bless me means please make me receptive to making my mind understand that. May my mind understand that and generate the mind that unceasingly, without stopping, continuously, day and night, takes its essence or makes the pith or the priorities the focus of my life. And Lama Tsongkhapa says something similar also in three principal aspects of the path that we did um, a couple years ago as our retreat, also a verse two. Perfect human rebirth is described here as those who are not attached to the pleasures of circling, who strive to make freedom and endowments meaningful, who entrust themselves to the path pleasing the victorious ones. You fortunate ones, listen with a calm mind. So basically, you fortunate ones means us fortunate ones and those who are not attached to the pleasures of circling, it means at least we're trying for some sort of renunciation. We don't need to have renunciation, but we need to realize that renunciation is self-compassion, that the greatest form of self-care is to have the determination to be free from suffering, the intention to emerge from suffering and the causes of suffering, to stop hurting ourselves, that's the kindest thing we can do. So if we're not attached to the pleasures of circling, we can enjoy the pleasures of samsara without being hooked. So if we're in that mind frame and are also striving to make the freedoms and the opportunities meaningful, then we kind of trust the Buddhist path, the path pleasing the victorious ones, meaning victorious over negative states of mind, victorious over suffering and afflictions and bad behavior. So it's like, if you're in this headspace, then you listen to these teachings with a calm mind and you know, calm and happy mind. So leisure is also called freedom. And it means having the time to accomplish the excellent doctrine of the Buddha. Fortune is also called opportunity. And it means having all the inner and outer conditions conducive to realizing the doctrine. And that's a quote from Geshe Lundrup Sopa, who was um, the teacher, the senior teacher at Deer Park in Wisconsin for many years, not the younger Geshe Sopa who's visited you guys. And he wrote this book, Cutting Through Appearances, which is just an amazing commentary on the three principal aspects of the path. And it also has some good stuff about tenants. So that's where that quote comes from. And then Chidin Rinpoche says, without wasting and rendering meaningless the attainment of a human existence that supports the eight types of leisure and 10 endowments, these fortunate disciples render it meaningful. So both great teachers are saying the pith of this is to really take the essence of our life, to make life meaningful, to really pursue things that are bigger than this day, bigger than ourselves, that have some sort of forward legacy, whether we believe in future lives or not, that has some sort of flowing outward effect, some sort of ripple effect to be of benefit in the long term to both ourself and others. So I'm just gonna review these a little bit and then we're gonna talk about them, but I just wanna make sure that you know what we're talking about when we say a perfect human rebirth. A perfect human rebirth has these eight leisures and 10 endowments. So there are four non-human states which either have too much suffering or too much pleasure 
to have the mental space to engage with practices and for conditions for humans that make life nearly impossible to practice the Dharma. So a perfect human birth is being free from being a hungry ghost a, or a hell being, a hungry ghost, an animal or a celestial being, meaning a God. And so this is a framework outside of the human realm. If we're taking these teachings literally, if we're putting these teachings all into a human context, it also works. So in either case, if you're dominated by hatred, pain and fear, there's too much suffering to practice the path. If you're dominated by miserliness and addiction, there's no mental space to practice. If you're dominated by ignorance, you can't practice because it doesn't even make sense to you. There's no kind of horizon opening for you. There's no curiosity, there's no ability. And if you're lost in pleasure and distraction, it doesn't even occur to you to practice because why change what's good? Forgetting that it will end and forgetting that others suffer. So those are the four non-human states, but you can also think of them in a human context. So then the conditions for humans that we are free from is we're free from being a human in a border region or being a barbarian. And what this really means is just being in a dangerous and unethical place. And of course, everywhere in the world is dangerous and unethical in one sense or another, some more than others, but we're a human being where the region is not so disturbed that it's not safe to sit with introspection. You know, we don't have to be on guard constantly, like being aware of attacks constantly. It might feel that way, maybe particularly times in Israel, it's felt that way and you've had to, but it's not a continuous thing forever. Sometimes you really do have enough safety to look inward and for it to be possible to do that. There's also ethics as a baseline understanding in secular society, even though people aren't perfect, even though not everyone does it, even though we're inconsistent, the worldview of where we live is generally that ethics is a good idea. Or at least if we want to practice ethics, we're not gonna get huge amounts of pushback. People will generally agree that the ethics of non-harmfulness is a nice way to live. So, we're free from being a human in a border region, which is dangerous and unethical. We're free from being a human where a Buddha hasn't descended. So there are places where the sentient beings are humans, but they haven't had the karma to see a Buddha with all four kayas, right? So there are Buddhas everywhere. B Buddhas pervade all of time and space. The enlightened mind is all pervasive, but we can't always see a Buddha in its full Nirmanakaya aspect who kind of explicitly says, yes, I am a Buddha. And you can sort of prove it by observing them. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not like we've seen Buddha Shakyamuni. We haven't seen Buddha Shakyamuni in this life, but Buddha Shakyamuni showed the aspect of a supreme Nirmanakaya. Really? Milana, you need to mute yourself. <clears throat> so Buddha Shakyamuni has existed within kind of living memory of sentient beings, human sentient beings. Um, um, let me just finish this and then, and then we'll talk about it because I can't see you. So let me just finish this particular set and then we'll talk about it. So... Um, a human with physical and or mental obstacles, these would be things that prevent independence. And a human with strongly held wrong views, this would be obstacles to non-harmfulness or obstacles to ethics. So we are free of all eight of these, which means we have leisure, we have time, we have ability and access. And so that's a profound situation. 
Okay, did, did anyone want to ask about those eight ledgers? Yeah, can you uh, tell us about the four kayas? Um, you did the four kayas with Andy um, when you did Buddha Nature. So, you know, so I'm not going to do a whole presentation right now, but just briefly, you know, they're the results of practicing method and the results of practicing wet wisdom. So the results of practicing method are the form bodies, the rupakayas, which were the supreme emanation body or the emanation body and the enjoyment body, the sambhogakaya and the namanakaya. The results of the wisdom side of the path are the dharmakayas. So the wisdom body and the nature truth body, the dharmakaya and the svabhavikakaya. So um, the four Buddha bodies are what we'll have when we've gotten to the path of no more learning. So, yeah, sorry, what? No, I said thank you. Sure. Sure. So, um, so just, you know, thinking that, of course, there are Buddhas, but a Buddha explicitly present teaching the whole path, there are kind of renaissances and dark ages. So a Buddha will come, a Buddha will teach the whole path to enlightenment, and those teachings will exist after they die for, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand years. And then they'll start to degenerate, like less and less teachings will be complete. Fewer and fewer people will be practicing them, and there will be more and more misunderstandings. And so the time after a Buddha dies is called the degenerate age. And we gradually slide into kind of a dark age, which is what we're in right now. And then eventually the Buddha's teachings are gone and a new Buddha has to reappear and start all over again. And in each cycle of a Buddha appearing, teaching, etc., many, many sentient beings are themselves becoming enlightened. And so every cycle, more sentient beings are getting out of samsara. Um, but, you know, this is kind of the cycle of things. And we see this historically, too, that there's, you know, a big wave of teachers and art and creativity and ethics and social change and, you know, kind of things coming together and then falling apart <laughs> and then coming together and then falling apart. So we live at a time where the Buddha isn't alive in an accessible way, but his teachings are. They haven't completely degenerated. And there were beings like Lama Tsongkhapa who noticed the degeneration and consciously went and tidied it up and got the teachings complete from the various countries that were holding different components and made sure it was complete again. So, you know, that's a very good news for us and it gives us a lot of freedom. So when we're looking at this perfect human rebirth conversation, we're just really trying to feel the incredible abundance of this life and this time that we're in. And the fact that even though things aren't perfect, they are actually perfect for practice. So that's the teaching, right? Is that things aren't perfect, but they're perfect for practice. So then we have these 10 endowments or opportunities so the opportunities are framed in terms of what one has rather than what one is free from. So there are five conditions or five related to our own conditions and five that are related to external conditions. So human in a central place, safe, free to pursue practice. Human where the fourfold Sangha there is the fourfold Sangha, meaning male and female practitioners, both lay and fully ordained. Um, a human with mental and physical independence, meaning that there is nothing severe enough in our physical difficulties or our mental difficulties that would prevent practice. And we have reversible karma meaning we haven't committed the five heinous deeds, or if we have, we understand how to purify. And we're a human with conviction in Dharma, meaning any Dharma, any teaching that has a solid ethical foundation and altruism. So it doesn't have to be specifically Buddhist Dharma to be considered Dharma. It can be any ethical system that has altruism as, it, as its core. So we have this incredible opportunity that this is where we are. And, you know, 
male and female um, practitioners, both lay and ordained, you know, in Israel, that's hard to get them all in one place. <laughs> but if you scan the whole country, you could, you know, find them, I'm sure. And, you know, especially now with technology, we have access, access to all fourfold Sangha. So it's important that people are practicing the Dharma in these four different ways, because it makes the kind of community that really is mutually supporting so you need people living a lay life with really, um, you know, normal priorities, work and family and school and busyness. And you need people that are really giving their whole focus to study and practice. You need both types of practitioners because if it's only lay, you might lose some detail and technique and some depth. And if only monastic, you might lose some contact with the everyday experience and worldly situation of sentient beings. So both groups need each other and they're not seen as like a hierarchy. It's, it's a mutual dependence. We need each other. So then the five that are external, this is um, what we were talking about a minute ago. Um, a Buddha has descended within recorded and oral oral history, a supreme Nirmanakaya emanation has been seen. For example, Buddha Shakyamuni was the last one. The next one is going to be Buddha Maitreya. Um, seven is a Buddha has taught. So there were causes for this supreme Nirmanakaya to teach. So we might have seen a Buddha, but if they don't teach, then we have no access to the medicine. The teachings remain. So we've created the karmic causes for the teachings to be accessible. You know, we speak the types of languages where Dharma has been translated into, um, and that's really a big deal. There continues to be sincere practitioners, meaning that the teachings are alive in present day students. And there is caring for others. Um, there are benefactors and communities of Dharma. So, you know, you just look at that list of 10 and you think these endowments or these opportunities, getting all of the conditions for this to happen is a rare thing and an incredibly precious thing. And we, we're just unbelievably fortunate. And hopefully that feeling of being fortunate makes us want to make the best use of it. So here's the list side by side and just have a look at that. <clears throat> As you look at the lists, and I don't know if that's too small for you to see, um, are there any questions before we kind of continue on with it? Any bits you want to unpack from the eight leisures or the 10 endowments? Just uh, chime right in. Is it a framework that has any impact on your mind? Does it, do, you know, or does it just seem like it's, these are things you take for granted and it's like, yeah, what? Yeah, everybody has that. Or lots of people have that. What? I don't feel so lucky. Or does it touch your heart in some way? Or do you kind of go back and forth between taking it for granted and feeling really fortunate? I mean, how does it land when you look at that list? Uh, the the hungry ghost. I can sometimes feel like that. Yeah. I can identify with the state of mind that are like hell rail, hungry ghost. So it's go forth and back and forth. So it helps uh, uh, in words, um, state of minds. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a good point. And, you know, we can see that list and say, yes, I have those things, but sometimes I really don't. You know, there are days when I really don't have all of those things complete, or I feel like, you know, I'm identifying with the hell realm or the hungry ghosts or the animals or the celestial beings definitely it can there can be that impression and that's valid and I think we all <clears throat> we all understand that I think and 
the, I guess the additional piece is just to consider that while it seems like sometimes our mind goes in those realms that are not conducive to practice, we actually are never in those realms. Whether you think of them literally or if you think of them in the human situation, we are not continuously as the default in our life so filled with hatred, fear, and anger, and suspicion that there's no space ever. But in certain war-torn areas where it's just constant conflict or certain marginalized communities where there's a lot of violence as part of the community, it's just not safe to sit and like consider what's the point of life. It's not safe. You have to like be listening. Is there danger out there? You know, and, and in terms of the hungry ghost realm, we might have our addictions, right? We have some addictions, I'm sure. Maybe chocolate, maybe coffee, maybe cigarettes, maybe heroin. I don't know what you guys get up to. Maybe Netflix. I mean, we all have like lots of addictions, but we don't have the type of addiction, which means there is absolutely no space ever. You know, we're, we're not in such a continually craving state that other people don't occur to us. You know, you probably have some people with addictions or who suffered from really coarse addictions at some point in their life in your kind of patient base. And you know, when they're in it, when they're completely absorbed in their addiction, empathy for others rarely occurs to them. You know, like they could steal from the people they love the most in order to get the money to buy more of what they want, right? The people they love the most in the world, they would steal from. Our addictions have not gone to that point in this second. We're not gonna steal from the people we love in order to fulfill our addiction. We're not that far gone in this second. Maybe we once were, maybe we will be in the future, but right now we're not. And that means an incredible amount of space for developing empathy and compassion is available to us. Even if generally speaking during the day, we're just kind of a little bit hungry for something with the senses all day, hungry for something for the eyes, for the ears, for the nose, for the tongue. We're just hungry, hungry, craving addiction addicts. It's not so bad that it's shut off our empathy all the time anyway, you know? And we are sometimes like an animal, you know? We're just trying to get food, trying to get resources, trying to mate, trying to get our family safe, trying to, you know, just kind of live in this getting through the day one day at a time kind of, you know, narrow focused way. But we're not always like that. You know, we're not, um, forced to be that by circumstance. And we're not a celestial being in the sense that our life is so filled with pleasure physically and mentally. Our life is so filled with, I don't know, fame and praise that we're just like drunk. You know, sometimes we have really amazing situation and we do get lost in it. We get lost in all sorts of pleasures we get lost in the joy of our resources. We forget about the plight of people with less than us. That definitely happens. But it hasn't happened to such a degree that others don't even appear to our mind. So like there's a relationship with those realms and ourselves, but we're not as far gone as beings in those realms, though we could be in the future and we definitely have been in the past. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, so you don't, so to be a perfect human rebirth doesn't mean that you're perfect, right? You know, you have all the mess, you have all the mess, but the meth is a workable mess as opposed to so oppressive, there's no way out of it. You know, they say beings in the hell realm, their capacity for pain is more than ours. So if we experience the pain of a hell realm being, we would die, you know, we, we, there would get to a certain threshold of pain and we would just die. But for them, they have the karma to experience even more pain, but not die because of it or not die from the causes of it. So, I mean, just think about when you've had a horrible headache or you've cut yourself really deeply, you know, chopping vegetables or some, you know, real coarse pain that you've had in your life. Really, that's all you can see when it's at the height of it. 
unless your mind is really well trained. Just like when you have intense pleasure at the height of it, other things don't occur to you besides what's just in front of you. So thank goodness we haven't gotten lost in those kind of distractions so much so that it's ruined our spiritual path. Okay, so basically we're looking at the meaningfulness of leisure and fortune and then the difficulty in finding leisure and fortune. So starting with therefore, um, so meaningfulness, therefore this life of complete leisure and fortune, which we have attained is extremely worthwhile. Using such a life, we can accomplish giving, ethics, patience, and so forth, which are the causes of the wonderful body and resources of high status, which we have now. In particular, in a life of leisure and fortune, we can generate the three vows, individual liberation or pratamoksha vows, bodhisattva vows, and tantric vows, and can easily accomplish the state of perfect Buddhahood in one short lifetime during the degenerate era. This life of worthwhile leisure and fortune is difficult to find, and if it is found, its essence should be used without wasting it pointlessly. So I think that's probably clear. And then the difficulty. This life of complete leisure and fortune is not only meaningful, but extremely difficult to find. Most beings, including humans, for the most part, engage in the 10 non-virtuous actions, which are obstacles to obtaining leisure and fortune. In particular, in order to obtain all aspects of life support of complete leisure and fortune, one needs a basis of a complete action of ethics, which establishes the main potency in the mind that when empowered produces a human life. One needs helping causes, giving and so forth, which establish potencies that supplement the main potency. One also needs conjunction of one life to another by means of stainless vow to gain enlightenment for the sake of others. So it's difficult for all of that to come together. So what, what we're saying here is if you want a perfect human rebirth, there are very specific ingredients. The main one is ethics. So we were ethical in the past. That's why we have this body and that's why we have these resources. We were ethical and we practice generosity, which is why we have resources. Now, having ethics and generosity are substantial causes for a perfect human rebirth, but there's a very important condition to make it ripen because all sentient beings have generosity and ethics in their mental continuum, all of them do. Did you wanna ask something, Firas and Noah? <clears throat> so all sentient beings have planted these seeds in their mental continuum, but not all sentient beings have what are called stainless aspirational prayers or like the will or the commitment to continue their spiritual path that wants to. So this like aspirational prayer or this um, urge or this will to continue the spiritual path, when that comes up at the time of death, that creates a bridge. So it means that your previously created positive karmic seeds can ripen at death and project a, a new rebirth as another perfect human rebirth. So we've created plenty of causes for more human rebirths, but we have to remember at the time of death to generate these types of aspirations to act as this bridge or this link to another perfect human rebirth. And what we want are back-to-back -back human rebirths all the way until enlightenment. Not any perfect human, not any rebirth, but a perfect human rebirth with these eight leisures and ten endowments, or a rebirth in a pure land. <laughs> but you know, if we're reborn as an animal, it's not the end of the world. If we're reborn in the hell realms, it's not the end of the world. We'll finish lots of negative karma. We'll probably create more negative karma, but it's not as heavy. The problem is the time span means we forget a lot. Yeah, if we spend a lot of time in the lower realms, we forget much of what we've learned. 
which is why we have to kind of keep reinventing the wheel. Maybe there are some things about the Dharma that felt familiar, even though it was the first time you heard it, because it was familiar. You did hear it before in some previous life, or it had echoes of things you learned in this life, of course, too. But, you know, why wasn't it at the forefront of your mind from the time you were a child? Too much time went by and you forgot. So, you know, we need mindfulness to help us not forget what we've learned in this life during this life, but we need aspiration at death to carry that through into whatever is next. So anything about perfect human rebirth before we shift gears to the official small scope? Did you want to? Yeah, course. go ahead. How, how, how animals return to the human career? When how, they how? die, they have a peaceful mind. If they, if they die with a peaceful mind, then one of their old virtuous seeds can ripen as a perfect human rebirth. So what can you do? So if, you're, if you own a pet or something, what you try and do is to make sure that your pet dies with a peaceful mind by, you know, tiny bit of morphine, not enough to kill them, don't kill your pets, but a little bit of pain relief. Um, you know, you can, you know, massage them and talk to them and tell them prayers and sing mantras to them, give them their favorite food, keep them warm and cuddly. Palliative care, hospice care for animals is the same as for humans. You know, what you would do for a human, you would do for an animal. And if you don't feel like you would do that for an animal, then don't take responsibility for having an animal in your life. <laughs> That's the Buddhist view. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, don't have kids unless you're going to take responsibility for looking after your kids. Right. <laughs> so no. that's the Buddhist view. Well, you go to the... Sorry. If you have a kid, you go to psychotherapy to get kids. <laughs> Animals can gain a karma by helping us be beings. It doesn't matter in the time of death if they, they can gain good karma in helping us take care of them and uh, being generous to us in our way of taking care of them. Um, certainly animals can accumulate good karma, definitely, and we can accumulate good karma in relation to looking after them. And all of the time you're spending with your pet, for example, looking after them, you're creating a strong karmic connection. So hopefully the next time you're both human beings, you'll have a natural warmth and affection and safety for each other, and you'll be able to teach them. Sorry, I can't hear you. What? I was kidding, but I'm going to meet my uh, dog in the next uh, reincarnation <laughs> as a human being. There was one nun at Chen Rezig Institute who was very famous for feeding all of the bush turkeys. And if you've ever seen bush turkeys, they're really, really stupid and they chase anything that looks like food and they're just very comical and they run around on the ground. They don't fly very often. And they're just sort of these kind of absurd creatures that are adorable, but not very smart. And this one nun had so much compassion for them. She loved the bush turkeys so much. And she would sit in her, um, she had a tiny A-frame house. You know, it was just tiny. You could touch both walls. And it had a little balcony. And she would take her bread and throw it off the balcony. And all of the bush turkeys would come and surround her. And one day my teacher was walking up the path and he saw her feeding all of the bush turkeys. And he went, oh, Lamo, many disciples. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, she was creating the cause for all of this affection and warmth and safety. And definitely, you know, when they all meet again, they're going to like her and they're going to listen to what she has to say. So, you know, we are benefiting our pets all the time, um, especially if we're at aspiring to do so in that way. Uh, yeah. I'm bothered by the question of uh, putting in suffering animal to sleep, you know, help them dying, if it's necessarily non-ethical or it's the opposite, because you're serving them to the point that uh, they suffer too much, so you help them pass away. Well, 
that is the worldly view and that is well intended it is not the buddhist view but it's it's you know you mean well the the problem with that view is that you're assuming that by putting them down that you're ending their suffering what you're doing is you're pausing their suffering they haven't finished that karma they just have to experience it in a future life what you're doing is creating killing karma that creates the cause for sickness and shortened life for yourself. And then you're creating a little bit of a difficult karma with you and that pet that you've loved so much and who has trusted you. And if we had clairvoyance, if we knew where that pet would go when they died, that it would definitely be positive. There might be an argument that we could put them down, but because we don't have clairvoyance, we don't know that where we're sending them is better. Yeah, and so it's much better for the relationship and it's much better for your own karma to do what you can to minimize their pain, but to not do that final act of actually killing them because killing is such a heavy karma. Mm. Now, of course, if you've put down pets in the past, your motivation mm. most likely was compassion, which means it's a much lighter killing karma than if you, you know, were driving around and you saw a dog and you were angry and you thought, I'm going to hit it, you know, like we would do that. But maybe, maybe someone was an angry teenager and did something like that. That's a heavy karma of killing because it was with anger and with intention. If in the past we killed our animals thinking that we were putting them out of their suffering, it's lighter, but it's still a negative karma. So we just, you know, do medicine Buddha, do Vajrasattva purify having done it and don't do it again is the Buddhist view. And then you guys decide because it's your life. <laughs> but the, the Buddhist view is there's really no excuse to ever kill unless you have amazing clairvoyance that can see how it's going to play out. And even then there's some slight negative effect for you. Remember that story of the Buddha in his previous life who killed the ship captain? Did you guys hear that story? Maybe SK told you? No, it's uh, one of the Buddha's previous lives. Um, he was a sailor on a ship and he had clairvoyance. He wasn't a Buddha yet, he was a Bodhisattva. And he could see in the mind of the captain that he was going to kill all 300 of the passengers on the ship. He was gonna like poison them. And he had a plan and he was gonna do it and it was gonna happen. And the Buddha saw that if he killed him, that there was a possibility of him taking a better rebirth if he timed it right. And definitely it would save all of these other human beings with their potential. So the Buddha killed the ship captain, but he still had to go to the lower realms. It was just very brief. So it's like he went to the hell realms when he died and then bounced out. <laughs> he just bounced right back out again, but he still had to go there for a second because it was still killing karma, which is incredibly heavy. So everything can be purified, absolutely. But there is pretty much never an excuse for killing from a Buddhist perspective. If the question is kill or be killed, be killed from a Buddhist perspective. So do with that information what you like. <laughs> I can imagine your arguments. You can do it over a cup of tea. So the meditation has um, the beginning part of death um, and it, the outline is there, but you don't have to read it.